Hi, my name is Stan Phelps. I want to wake, welcome everyone for episode five of the Back to Black webinar series. Um, this is number five in a series of nine where we're exploring customer experience, employee experience, and brand experience in a post-corona world, what we're calling ECPC. And so it, why, why are we calling this thing uh, back to black? Well, in order to, uh, to explain that, we have to go all the way back here to 1973. And this is Angus, uh, Angus Young, at the age of 18 with his brother Malcolm, who was 20, they decided to start a rock and roll band in Australia. And just one year after starting the band, uh, they needed to replace their lead singer. And they caught up with a fellow Scotsman who had immigrated to Australia. His name was Bon Scott. And he became the lead singer and the lead lyricist for the band. And just one year later, the band launched their first album. Um, it was called High Voltage. And it was successful. And over the course of the next five years, they would launch another five albums. And just 40 years, just a little over 40 years ago, in the beginning of 1980, the band was finishing the Highway to Hell tour, and they happened to be in England, and they decided to go out for a night of drinking in the pubs in England. Now, Bon Scott was a notorious partier and went at it pretty hard and unfortunately drank so much that he blacked out, became unconscious, and his friends, in their wisdom, decided to throw him in the back of a car so he could just sleep it off. And when they checked on him the next morning, unfortunately during the night he had vomited and had thrown up on his own vomit and aspirated and tragically passed away at the age of 33. Now this was just a crushing blow. It was a tragedy for the band. They flew Bon back home to Australia. They had funeral services. And the band could not, ACDC could not see a way to go forward without, without Bon. But their friends and their relatives really pushed them and said, no, you have to push forward. This is what Bon would have wanted. And sure enough, uh, just a month after his tragic passing, they started to hold auditions and they ended up hiring Brian Johnson, who was an Englishman who uh, had been a front man in a, a previous band called Jordy. And within one week of hiring Brian, on April 1st of 1980, they handed him a plane ticket. He must have thought it was an April Fool's joke. And that plane ticket was to head to the Bahamas and be able to record the next album for ACDC. Now, imagine this, learning a new lead singer. They also purposely decided not to use any of the material that Bond had written for the new album. So they had to create everything new and over the next seven weeks, they worked together. Um, and at the end of those seven weeks in the Bahamas, pretty trying times, learning how to work kind of in a new normal situation, they released the seminal album from ACDC, Back in Black. And the, the album cover is in black in tribute to Bon Scott. Um, and that album would release later that summer and become one of the, the greatest selling albums of all time. Um, in fact, if you could see there, I mean, 50 million albums sold. Some lists say it's the second best selling album of all time. So ACDC really was, and this album was 
kind of a, the inspiration behind how we're all going to have to work differently going forward and adapt to a changing world. And so that became the, the impetus of calling the series ECPC, again, Employees and Customers Post-Corona. Um, we're sitting right now at the, uh, the fifth episode in the series. Um, so today is going to be all about technology. Also really excited about next week, which is going to be about differentiation and strategy. I'll be joined with, with uh, David Rendell next week for that. Um, but this week is all about technology, specifically five ways to leverage technology, data, and analytics uh, to create profits. Uh, so excited to, to jump into this. And in order to do so, I want to share two stories. And those two stories, um, we're going to have to take you all the way back to just one year after Back in Black came out. Um, and that year was 1981. And I'm going to tell you a story of a 16-year-old kid named Michael who took a summer job working at a newspaper called the Houston Post. Now, this used to be the evening newspaper in Houston. And Michael's job was to sell subscriptions to the paper. Now, technology-wise, what technology did, was Michael afforded? This was his piece of technology. Essentially, he had to smile and dial. And what's interesting is that Michael learned very quickly as he was smiling and dialing that only two groups of people pretty much ever subscribed to the, to the newspaper. And it was one, people that had just gotten married, or two, people who had just purchased a new home. So armed with this insight, Michael decided, um, very, very, very smartly decided that he took a couple friends that weren't doing much that summer, fellow 16-year-olds, and he had them go around all of Houston to find as many lists of people that had just gotten married or had just bought, their, bought a home. And then what Michael did was actually create a personalized letter that he would send to these people, congratulating them on their marriage or congratulating them on their new home. Now, that summer, Michael sold so many subscriptions using this strategy. He sold his commissions alone were $18,000 back in 1981. And he just worked for three months. And if you can imagine this, this was more than Michael's home economics teacher made the entire year. So what do you do when you're a 16 year old and you make $18,000? I'll tell you what you do. You go out and you buy yourself a Corvette. And that's exactly what Michael, Michael did. Um, so question for you, um, oh, a little bit of postscript. A year after this summer, Michael would head off to the University of Texas where he'd enroll. And in his dorm room, his sophomore year, Michael ended up creating a software company. So in the, in the, uh, in the chat, if you think you know who, who this Michael is, uh, see if anybody can get this in the chat. All right. Oh, we've got you. We've got it. Uh, absolutely right. It was Michael Dell. Um, and I love this as an example because, hey, it's, it's using a little bit of technology with the phone, but using data 
um, and a little bit of ingenuity to make it happen. And it's a great example of what in the book Blue Goldfish we call the idea framework. And so the I in the idea framework is to inquire. And it's to be able to ask the questions, to be able to get the insight to, like Michael did with the letter campaign, he designed a solution. He put a pilot together really quickly. He evaluated how effective it was. And then once he knew it was worked, he advanced and went forward with the strategy. And that's what we call the idea framework. Um, now, I mentioned two stories to start out. That's the first one. Let me tell you the second story. Now, this one is about, um, we're going to go down under for this. Westpac is the third largest bank in Australia and New Zealand. Um, so they have over a million customers for this bank. Each month, they generate a tremendous amount of data. In fact, over 100 million transactions through their system. And what Westpac did was pretty clever, is they started to look at those million plus customers that they had, and they started to study what, they, what products and service they use from Westpac at different points in their life. Now, based on the analytics, they were starting to see patterns of what people would use, again, at different points in their lifespan. And armed with that knowledge and great software from, from SAS, they created a program called the NOMI program. Now, the NOMI program um, was simple. The idea was using those analytics, they could predict what the next, next product or service that um, their customers would want. So they created a standing offer in their system for near, the first year of the program for nearly 70% of their customers. Now the next time that customer walked into a bank branch or they called customer service, at the end of the transaction, they'd be presented with the offer. Um, now, I've got two decades as a marketer. Um, I know this. What happens in marketing if you make everyone the same offer? What would be a great conversion percentage? Let's say, for example, if it was a bank and you offered everyone the same credit card. Well, typically with that type of outreach, like a direct mail program, maybe if the average is about one to 2%, uh, jokingly say if you write great copy and the, it's an appealing offer, maybe you get 5%, that might get you promoted. Um, but Sal, let's do this. Let's, let's bring up, um, let's bring up uh, the poll, because I want to ask a question of everyone here. Um, let's launch that poll. What percentage of offers do you think that Westpac created year one of this program. All right, so I'm seeing them start to come in here. We'll give everybody about another 15 seconds. Okay, I see a bunch for 53, 21%, 46%. Okay. Five seconds if you wanna get it in. Okay, let's launch the results, Sal. So the, you had the right answer. So it was the first year of the program, they converted 46% of those next best offers. That drove over $20 million to Westpac's bottom line through those additional products and services. But more importantly, you think about it from a banking perspective, what happens, when, what happens when you take somebody who has just two products with you and they now have three? 
or they had three and now they have four. Um, that stickiness and the ability to retain that customer has been greatly increased. Um, great, so both of, those, uh, both of those examples are, I think, great examples of the first of five elements that I wanna talk about today. Um, and it, they deal with relationship and the importance of number one, the ability to personalize that experience using technology data and analytics. And again, that's number one is personalization. It's gonna be one of five ways that we're gonna talk about today. Now, why do I think it's important? Because I think going forward, the challenge is that in the, the future, the expectations of our customers have been raised enor enormously. They never quite just stay the same. They're always going up and up. Um, and so now the customers today expect that when they interact with a company, that not only is it gonna be personalized, but it's gonna be a very quick and attentive experience. And in some cases, they're gonna expect the company to actually understand them and predict what they want next. Now to shine some light on these expectations, um, here's a little bit of uh, example from IBM. IBM talked about this idea that three out of four customers expect that the organizations that they deal with are gonna understand them down to an individual level. They also said that four, more than four out of five expect that when they interact with a company, that that company is gonna do it faster and faster. And lastly, little more than two out of three say that they anticipate that the, the customers that they deal with, excuse me, the companies that they deal with are gonna harmonize the experience, meaning that everything works together. They can connect with the company in one channel and then go to another channel and pick up right where they left off, kind of in harmony. Um, so if that's the challenge, um, what is ultimately the solution? And I, I think the solution is probably, um, actually Jack Welch kind of puts it the best. He said, the late Jack Welch now, he passed away about two months ago. Um, he said that there's only two keys to competitive advantage going forward. And he said, one, he said, it's learning about your customers faster than your competition can. So how do you know and how do you learn more about your customers faster than your competition? But he said that that only gets you insight. And insight without action and moving forward isn't worth anything. So he said the second part of that is being able to turn those insights into action faster than your competition can. And the concept that we talk about and what Jack is talking about here is what trendwatching.com calls InfoSense. Now InfoSense is, is simply the ability to use data to really understand your customers and be able to personalize the experience that you provide for them. So it's a concept that my co-author Evan Carroll and I call a blue goldfish. Um, so really quickly you're going, what, what the heck is a blue goldfish? Let me explain the first off the color piece of it. Um, so the, the blue is, um, it was the fourth color in now 10 different colors in the series, but the first three colors, purple, green, and gold, were an, an homage to this iconic American city. And that city is New Orleans, and it's because of its most famous event, and that most famous event is Mardi Gras, the three official colors of Mardi Gras are purple, green, and gold. 
And it's an homage to, to New Orleans because there's one word that comes from New Orleans that exemplifies this idea of doing a little bit more than what's expected. And it's a word that Mark Twain in his autobiography said was worth traveling all the way to New Orleans to get. That one word is called lanyap. And lanyap is it's Creole, so it's French and Spanish. It literally means the additional gift or to give more. So it's the idea of not just doing the transaction, but purposely doing a little something that's added, um, that little extra. And in this case for the blue goldfish, it's how do you use technology, data, and analytics to, to raise that experience up. Now, specifically why blue? Blue was an ode to this guy right here. This is King Harold Gormanson. And back in the 1990s, Sony, Intel, IBM, Ericsson, we're all working together in a consortium to try to create a standard for wireless area net networking. Um, and a couple of the engineers back in the 1990s that were out one night and they were talking about the idea that they needed a code name. And it turns out that one of them was reading a book about King Harold Gormeson. He was a 10th century Danish king um, he was distinct because he was known by his nickname. King Harold had a tooth that had died and discolored over the course of time. And so his nickname was Bluetooth. And he was pretty amazing king. He, he united all of Scandinavia. Um, king Harold converted the Danes to Christianity. Um, and so they thought it was going to be a great code name, thinking that marketing would ultimately come along and create a better name for that wireless networking standard. Well, marketing never figured it out, and um, Bluetooth was adopted as the, the wireless networking standard. And we love it as a symbol, just like um, King Harold had brought all of Scandinavia together. This idea of bringing stuff together to be able to stand out. Now, a little bit of trivia. If you go to the, uh, the Danish alphabet, um, the H, you're looking at the H and the B, so the H for Harold and the B for Blatond or Bluetooth. If you put those together, what do you get? the iconic symbol for Bluetooth. Okay, so that is, a little, that is a little bit of background on why blue. Now, really quickly, why a goldfish? So the goldfish is the central metaphor in the entire series. Um, it has to do with my personal experience. My very first pet was a goldfish. And so when I was six years old, look at all the hair that I had when I was six. Um, but I remember bringing home my bag of goldfish and it turns out that goldfish only grow to be so big. In fact, the average goldfish is the size of your thumb um, on average. Well, some only grow to be two inches and I come to find out some to grow to be much bigger. In fact, you're looking right now at the Guinness Book of Records size for a goldfish. Now, not a carp, not a koi. This is nearly 20 inches. So think about that. The average ordinary goldfish, average is the size of your thumb. 20 inches is the size of an average domesticated house cat. How is that even possible, right? That would be like walking out of your, your house or your apartment today 
and bumping into somebody who's three stories tall. How, how is that even possible? Well, it turns out that uh, the growth of a goldfish is impacted by five things, and those same five things apply to every organization out there. And so I'm gonna zip through them really quick, lightning speed. Um, the first thing, if you're a goldfish, you're impacted by the size of the bowl or the pond that you're in. And this is a direct correlation. So the bigger the bowl, the bigger the pond, the more that goldfish can grow. So what is that in business? What's the size of the bowl or the pond? It's simply this, it's the market for your product or service. And the bigger the market that you serve, the more you can grow. Makes sense. Now, the, the second one is based on who? The other goldfish that are in the bowl or the pond. Now, this one's an inverse relationship. So the more goldfish there are, typically the less that they grow. The less goldfish, they tend to grow more. Who are the other goldfish if you're in business? No brainer. Who are they? They're your competition, right? And it makes sense. The more competition you have, the harder it's gonna to be to grow. Here's number three. Their growth is also impacted by this, the quality of the water that that goldfish is in. Um, so the more nutrients in the water, the less cloudiness in the water, the more the goldfish will grow. So what is that quality of the surrounding if you're in business? Well, in macro terms, what is it? It's the economy, right? It makes sense. We're in the midst of a global pandemic right now. That surrounding environment, your ability to get capital, consumer confidence, people's willingness to purchase are all gonna to affect how a business can grow. Number four, simply this, how a goldfish does in its first four months of life, they are tiny when they're born. Check this out. They're the size of like a, a pin, the top of a pin. They have 100 brothers and sisters, so how they do in the first 120 days will determine ultimately how big they get. So what do you call a business first four months of being in business? Well, that's when you're a startup. Or when you launch a new product or service, how it does in the first four months will impact ultimately how well that product or service will do. Here's number five genetic makeup. So what is that goldfish born with that separates it from all of the other goldfish? And the more that they're separated, um, typically the bigger they get, the stronger their genes are. If their genes are weak and they're like everyone else, the less they typically grow. So what's, what's genetic makeup if you're in business, it's differentiation. How do you stand out in what myself and my co-authors would call a sea of sameness? Now, think about it for a second. You've been in business already for four months, right? What do you, what do you, have, what do you have control over? Does anyone have control over the market or your competition or the economy? No, no, and no. The only thing you have control over is how you differentiate yourself. How do you stand out, especially with the experience, how you do what you do? And a big part of that, I think, going forward is how we leverage technology, data, and analytics. So I mentioned my co-author, Evan Carroll, and I uh, created this thing called the Blue Goldfish Project. And we looked at over 
hundred examples of how companies leveraged technology to level up the experience. And it turns out there's eight different types. Today we're only gonna cover five, um, but they flow into they flow into essentially these three categories, relationship, responsiveness, and readiness. And we've already talked about one from that relationship category, that was personalization. That was the Westpac and the Dell example, the, the Houston Post from Michael. Let's talk about another one though from relationship, and we call that uh, personal data slash behavior change. Now, what this type is all about is how do you give people access to their own data to be able to affect how they actually behave? And the example we love here is from John Hancock, and it's from uh, Financial Services Insurance. And it John Hancock has this program called Vitality. And how it works is they send you a, like a Fitbit, a fitness tracker, and you can enroll into the program. Now what that, that tracker does, it tracks your fitness and wellness. And what's amazing is that if you eat well and you exercise and you maintain healthy behaviors, your premiums can go down by as much as 25%. So it's giving you control over your own data to be able to affect how much you ultimately pay for your insurance. Um, some great examples now from car insurance where you can plug in, Progressive has an option, so does Allstate where they can monitor your driving and you end up getting the discount. What I love about Vitality is that it works in the opposite direction as well. If you're part of the program, you're not eating healthy, you're not exercising, your premiums can go up by as much as 25%. Now, one of the exercises that we like to do, um, we call it the, the mind the gap exercise. And I love it, we, uh, we have a whole workbook around blue, but what's cool about this one is essentially it forces you to ask three different questions. One, what do you know, what, what do you know about your customers today? That's step one. Step number two is all the way across that gap. That is, if you could know anything, what would you wanna know about your customers, right? If what piece of information and insight would you want to have? And then the exercise is in that middle, and it's why I called Mind the Gap. The third step is how can you figure out ways to fill that gap? How could you append the information that you already have? What other sources could you pull in to be able to create that? Now, personalization and personal data behavior change are the first two. I wanna share two from the second R, and that's this. This is responsiveness. So not only do you have to personalize the experience, but you need to make it quick. And so the first type we're gonna talk about in the book, we call this type customer service three Point oh. And the idea that we all need to raise the level of our game when it comes to being responsive to the customers that we serve. And this is, uh, this is Jeff Bezos here. This is a number of years ago. He launched a product. It was a tablet um, called the Kindle Fire HDX. And on the home screen, it had a very interesting button. Um, it was called the Mayday button. And the idea on the Mayday button is you could press this button and the promise was that within 15 seconds that someone would pop up on your screen on video and you could give them, if you wanted, control of your device and they'd be able to work through any question you had with the tablet. 
Um, let me show you, this is a quick uh, commercial of, of how, it, how it worked. Mayday. Thank you for pressing the Mayday button. How can I help you? Whoa, who are you? <laughs> I'm Amy, a tech advisor for your new Kindle Fire. I didn't realize I get a live person. Yeah, we're here 24 seven. We can draw on your screen and even show you how to use different features. So I can just press the Mayday button and you're here to help? Hit Mayday and I'm coming to the rescue. Amy? I like you. Aw. <laughs> Introducing the revolutionary Mayday button, only on the new Kindle Fire HDX. Now what's super interesting is when they launched the Kindle Fire HDX and they launched this feature, it was right around April 1st and literally everyone thought it was an April Fool's joke. Um, that within 15 seconds someone would pop up on the screen. Uh, and so they launched it, um, they actually just retired it recently but what's amazing was they weren't able to fulfill on that 15 second guarantee of pushing the button and someone popping up on the screen because the last time I had checked, the average waiting time was only nine seconds. Now think about the last time you needed to contact customer service, how long did it take to find that number or be able to reach out to be able to get a response. They were doing it with a video chat in less than 10 seconds. So that's customer service 3.0. The fourth type I wanna to cover today is waiting. Um, and here's the thing from a, a waiting perspective. Waiting is inevitable in business. In fact, the more successful you are in business, typically the more your customers are gonna to have to wait. And so if anyone's went through the home buying process of getting a mortgage, you know that that is a painful process um, to be able to make that work. Um, so Wells Fargo, a number of years ago, they came out with an app, it's called Your Loan Tracker. And the idea is that in real time, you could use the app and be able to check out where you are at, at any given point in the process, what information you still needed to provide and get a sense of where you were. So if you can't improve the waiting, at least you can manage it to make it a little more palatable. So I love it. That's the fourth type. How do you manage waiting? Um, and I call this almost like the Uber effect where, or the Domino's pizza tracker where you can actually, while you're waiting, be able in real time to see where you're at in the process. The fifth type comes from the final uh, category, the final R, which is called readiness, and it's called frictionless commerce. So how do you, and it, it actually should be now called like touchless commerce. But how do you make things easier for the customers when you're serving them um, and be able to take as much friction out of the process as possible? So for this one, I'm gonna go to another Amazon example. And I wanna, I wanna ask you a serious question and feel free in the chat if you're gonna be honest. Has anyone experienced this before? You, you can admit to it. I think uh, technically we've all had this happen. Technically it's called the oh sheet moment um, to keep it above brow. brow uh, the oh sheet moment. So what do you do in this situation when you're sitting there and you're out of toilet paper. Um, if you search for images, this is by far the most creative. I love this. This is a very nasty person who wrote this. What would MacGyver do? That's not nice. Okay, but um, if you had to create a solution for it, leave it to Jeff Bezos and the team at Amazon. They created a solution. They called it the Amazon Dash button. 
And the idea with these uh, Bluetooth enabled devices is that you could connect them wherever you needed. In this case, you could attach it to um, your toilet and it was already configured with the exact brand of toilet paper that you'd like. You simply press the button, it wirelessly sends a signal attached to your Amazon account through Wi-Fi and orders whatever type of, in this case it's Cottonelle, whatever type of, of tissue you want. So kind of a fun example, but a good example for how do you remove friction in the process to make it easy for um, the customers that you deal with to do business with you. And the more you can remove friction and make it convenient, the better you're gonna do. So we're, we're about to open it up to, to questions and comments. I saw the note from, from Sal in here. Feel free to put, that, put those in the Q&A. We'll start to collect those. Um, but I wanna leave you with the process that we go through when we workshop this. And I touched on it initially with the Dell example. Um, it's a simple four step process. The I in the idea is to inquire. So how can you discover where that friction is? How can you figure out ways that you can personalize or predict the experience that your customer wants? Once you're armed with those insights, you immediately start to design potential solutions and ideas to address those either gaps or opportunities uh, in the experience. And once you've designed them, um, what you wanna do is then go through what we call an, the evaluate process. So how do you make sure internally that you've vetted the idea, that it's something that you can do system-wise, that your employees are on board, how can you make sure you validate it with the customers to make sure that they're seeing the value. But then once you've piloted it and you know it's successful, how then do you advance the idea? Meaning how do you sell it in? How do you make sure you have the resources? How do you measure it? And how do you effectively launch it across the enterprise? So we've got about 15 minutes left. I've got about a five minute story that I'm gonna to share towards the end um, from the happiest place on earth. So you're gonna to wanna to stick around for that story. But let's open it up to questions and comments. And I'm gonna I'm gonna start with one I almost always get when I when I do the blue goldfish presentation. Um, it's one of the more popular in the series that I do. And the question is always this, yes, Dan, it's great to use data and technology and analytics, but what happens when you kind of cross the line of, of becoming creepy, right? When do you cross that line and it actually looks like you're, you're stalking or you're doing it in a way that's contrived, um, and so I think that's a really valid question. You need to do it in a way that reinforces both warmth, that you have the right intent, and two, competence, that you're doing it in a way that shows that you know what you're doing and that you're respectful of, of the customers you're dealing with. And so the, the thing I always share is this, you know, it should be um, less big brother, right? And more big mother, right? Caring and competent as opposed to creepy. Great, I'm gonna open up the, the Q&A. Uh, Gabby's got a question. How can we balance the need to inquire and ask for data from our customers so we can improve their experience with increasing concerns over data privacy. Um, yeah, I, again, this is gonna get back to the, the creepy versus and stalking element. I think 
when you look at the research that most customers are willing to share and give permission to companies if they believe it's going to elevate and provide a better experience for them. So I think it, the burden is on us as the organization, you know, to really be able to, to show in a transparent way of the things that we're going to do with that data and also to give our customers a, you know, an opt out if they're not feeling um, that we're doing things in the right way. Um, and there's, there's a great case study that happened a number of years ago. Target, Target the, the department and grocery store here in the US, collects a ton of data about their customers. And they can tell from what people are buying um, what's happening in the lives of their customers. And so they were able to surmise in this case that potentially somebody in the, the household was pregnant based upon what was being bought. And so they sent some outreach to the customer and it turned out that it was the teenage daughter within the family. And so as you can imagine, that backfired uh, greatly. Um, here's another one that I, I, I like um, is, hey Stan, can you share any examples of companies that are doing this right, like right now, as it deals with COVID-19. Um, and so an example that I really like, uh, the convenience store and the gas station here that I like in, in North Carolina, I'm in the Research Triangle Park area, um, is called Sheets. Uh, sheets with a Z at the end. Uh, sheet with a Z at the end. And I love this, if you have the app through Sheets, you can do self checkout. You don't have to wait in line. You don't have to deal with somebody at the counter. Of course, they have plexiglass like almost every other retailer has, but I love that giving the control to say, hey, if you wanna check yourself out, don't feel like you have to do. Um, I also like a lot of the delivery companies now are offering contactless um, deliveries. So I think that's a cognizant way. Um, this great, great observation here from Mark. It seems that the pandemic has granted all companies carte blanche to grossly extend the waiting period. In my opinion, a company who touts shorter waiting times could be a big winner in this time. I think, it's a, I think that's a, a fine line and a good observation, Mark. I think one, we always have to be able to manage expectations. And I do appreciate, especially if we all order maybe from Amazon through Amazon Prime, that they're managing the level of expectation based on what's ordered by an individual. And if what you're ordering is considered kind of quote unquote non-essential, then you know that the waiting time could potentially be longer. Um, so I agree with you, you could potentially raise the bar here and be more aggressive, but I think you also need to be realistic um, to be able to manage the, the expectations correctly. Um, great. Just want to see if there are any other, give it maybe another 30 seconds, any other questions uh, coming in regarding leveraging technology, data, and analytics. And I don't see any more coming in, so I, I promised a, a final story. And so let's, let's take you to the the happiest place on earth. I know that this is gonna, Mark's gonna really enjoy this. And I wanna tell you a story about when Disneyland was founded. So it was founded by Walt Disney um, all the way back in 1955. 
And what's amazing, it wasn't an overnight success. Um, and just two years after the park opening in 1957, Walt had an idea. And his idea was this, uh, I think he came up with it in November of 57. He decided, he, Walt absolutely loved parades. And so his idea was to do a parade right down Main Street at Disney and to do it, to, to hire the people and to build the floats, it was gonna cost Disney back in 1957, $350,000, $350,000. That's over 5 million in today's dollars. So when the accountants heard this, they flipped out. They immediately found Walt, they sat him down and said, Walt, don't do the parade. He said, these people, these customers next month at Disney, they're, they're already going to be in the park, right? They're not going to miss the parade because they're not even expecting it. And I love this. Walt thought, it, thought about it for a second. And he looked up at his accountants and he said, you know what? He said, that's exactly why we need to do the parade. He said, here... At Disney, we always need to give our customers a little more than what they expect. He said, because if we don't, and they decide not to come back to the park, he said, it's going to cost us 10 times the amount of money to get them to come back. Well, what did they do back in that December of 1957? Did they move forward? Yeah, they did. And they did that parade, right? And if you think about it, that parade, that parade has become the signature thing that Disney does that differentiates it from any other theme park. You see, Walt had a simple mantra, and his mantra was this, always exceed expectations. He always wanted to figure out ways he could do a little bit more. In fact, he created his own word for it. He called it plussing. And the idea was he would look at an experience and say, how can we plus it up and do, 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 just do a little bit more? Now, Walt passed back in the, in the, I believe it was the early 1970s when he passed away. Um, he never got to see Disney World open in Orlando. Um, but what's amazing is that just about a decade ago, Disney was facing a huge problem. People were not coming back to the park um, year after year. The experience that they had in the park um, was kind of troubling. Um, people were rushing to go from one ride to another to get their fast passes. Um, everything that they had, they had to have money. They used to have to have things for their pictures, their, if they were staying at the resort, their card key. Um, it became too much and people were not coming back. And that's what when Disney looked to technology. In fact, underneath the, the Cinderella's castle within the park, there is this amazing command center. And tis, Disney doubled down on technology um, to be able to figure out ways that they could not only increase the amount of rides, but be able to elevate the entire customer experience for those guests at the park. Um, and they had all sorts of ways to be able to add capacity to a ride. Um, if the waiting was long, maybe they would send a character over to entertain people in line. Um, they even had an on-demand parade that they could strategically send out 
if one part of the park was becoming too crowded, it would divert traffic to that one part of the park with that on-demand parade. But the solution that they really uh, worked on ended up being the Disney Magic Band. And in this simple uh, RFID enabled device, they were able to dramatically improve the, the, the experience for all of their guests. And I can tell you this, it works a whole lot better than the analog uh, alternative uh, for sure. Um, and so armed with that, Disney was able to really rethink the experience leveraging technology data and analytics to uh, once again rethink and improve the guest experience. So that's it for the Blue Goldfish. Uh, thanks for hanging in there. Really quick, excited about next week, we're gonna be talking about the, the Pink Goldfish. I'm gonna be joined with my co-author on that, Dave Rendell, and a little bit of a, uh, a heads up, we are actually gonna go out on tour in July and the beginning of August, traveling literally starting in the Northeast, but going all the way across the country. Um, and if you think that this actually looks like a goldfish, that's merely coincidence in terms of how those dots play out. Um, but let us know if you're along the way we'd, and want to host us for an event or just catch up for a meal or a cup of coffee. Uh, certainly reach out. But thank you for taking the time uh, this afternoon. We'll see you next Tuesday. Have a great week.